So my name is Anandi uh, Solis Nepal. Um, thanks, Liz. And thanks, everyone, for the invite out here. Oh, apologies. Um, thanks, everyone, for the invite. This is wonderful. Um, I think I speak for Tony and myself. This is our first trip out here. So um, we had a wonderful conversation with the CDS group this morning. And um, I hope to have more conversations about this as we go forward. Um, this is kind of an experiment. And um, the more partners we can have in conversation around these projects, I think will be um, the better for it. Um, so I work at the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship, um, and my role right now has just changed from being purely a production person at the center um, to being a training specialist for graduate students, but I still work on a few digital publishing projects and in media production, and the Coast Atlas is one of the projects that I've uh, maintained a firm grasp on. You can pry it from my cold, dead hands. Um, I really enjoy working on it. Um, <coughs> And um, I'm also um, a PhD candidate at Emory in the Division of Religion. So. Mm -hmm. and I'm Tony Martin. I'm in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Emory. I've been at Emory for 27 years, uh, teaching in geosciences, environmental studies, environmental sciences, all those various permutations that have happened over the years. My training is, a, is as a geologist, a paleontologist, and an ichnologist someone who studies animal traces and behavior associated with traces, but all of the courses I've been teaching at Emory in environmental sciences have also contributed to this project. I've done work on the Georgia coast on and off uh, since 1998. I have a large book, a very thick doorstop kind of book done on the Georgia coast, and as the faculty lead in the project, I've been contributing a fair amount of the content and working with the Center for Digital Scholarship on this, and it's been great. And thank you for inviting me here. Yeah. Um, so as we go through, we're going to kind of tag team to talk about our um, areas of um, special, uh, speciality in this project, mine being mostly working on the web platform and working with our web develop developer to develop this platform, which is, um, as we'll get to it, is a very um, unique case um, for our center. Perhaps you'll have heard um, of some projects over here um, that are kind of struggling with some of the same issues of um, having robust visuals, robust databases, but also needing to work with faculty and their content production needs. Um, and so I'll be speaking mostly from that angle, and Tony will be uh, speaking from the faculty perspective to try and give you all a sense of what it's been like to work on this project together. So, Tony, if you wanna. Yeah, the project, we were thinking about how we could combine for content the geological history of the Georgia coast as a place, and the geological history then connects to that other dimension of time. So it's not just the sense of place, but the sense of place in the context of time. And the Georgia Barrier Islands lend themselves really well to this concept because they've been around uh, on and off for the last 40,000 years or so for uh, their composite geological islands. But there's also a fascinating cultural history. So this is where it intersects with the humanities and social sciences that the Georgia Barrier Islands have been connected to this long human history. So we'll get into some of the uh, concepts of how these are not pristine environments. People have interacted with these environments. How do we convey that then in the Atlas project? So our prototype then is combining the Center for Digital Scholarship and the Department of Environmental Sciences with me and colleague Michael Page, who's the geographer on this, as well as the drone pilot. And then how to be able to put this all together so that we have a pilot project that we can maybe demonstrate to people like you here at Brown, but within our own university, how we might use this as a platform for other in-house projects associated with digital scholarship. Yeah, so one of the things we wanted to do with the Atlas is thinking about how the Georgia coast gives us this opportunity of a place where we can kind of reinvent an idea about what a monograph is like. So I know a lot of you have, have been doing work with thinking about or, or rethinking digital monographs. How do we take the concept of this scholarly work, a very thick scholarly work, and translate that into something that's publicly accessible and that people can connect to at various levels, whether in the public or and uh, universities, and how we can then also, with that, develop some new perspectives. How do we think about this in different ways using the advantages of digital scholarship? Uh, a lot of this we agreed it from the beginning. We wanted it to be open access. We wanted it to be available to the public so that it does give back, especially to the people who are there on the coast. 
that this isn't something that we parachute in and out and do our work, but we want to somehow connect to the people who are there as well uh, and its long history. But we also want to think about this, again, as scholars. How does this connect in a legitimate way to scholarship that's done at universities, places like Brown or Emory, and how can we can encourage other people at other universities to do similar sorts of work? And I'll just mention here that um, in part of producing this open access, publicly accessible scholarship, um, it's something that we talked about with the CDS group this morning is um, how do we incentivize faculty and scholars to take part in this, um, in this project and um, share with us their knowledge and using this platform to share out that knowledge um, to a variety of different audiences. Um, and is that we're hoping to produce a peer-reviewed platform. So it's not only open access, but peer-reviewed. And you know, we're currently working on on that now. Um, the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship is also home to Southern Spaces, the um, journal that looks at you know, the South, big S. Um, and uh, it's, kinda, it's our flagship journal, in-house open access, um, multimedia, I wouldn't say multimodal quite yet, journal. Um, and so using some of their, um, uh, their frameworks of building that, we hope to leverage that in-house knowledge to help us create a peer-reviewed platform here. Um, and so thinking about these things from the beginning, this is also something, that's something we mentioned with the CDS group this morning, is that that's going to change what the platform looks like, what it does, and how we develop it from the beginning. Um, so the prototype that we'll be showing and talking about right now is, is to showcase specific experiments and functionality. So how do we think about a digital atlas? What, are, what do we look for in a digital atlas and how we've conceived it? And so we'll go through and we'll showcase the site. Um, as long as Leaflet is working for us today, <laughs> we'll be able to show you the entire site. Um, but then as we move forward in developing the platform fully, and I'll mention a little bit about this and happy to take questions um, about platform development as we move forward. Um, these questions, um, these statements here of what we're looking for in addition to the peer reviewed part, um, or how we're looking at developing a platform, not taking existing ones and trying to shoehorn our project into them, but developing a new platform to help us with some of these questions. So um, I'm going to go through a few of our um, kinds of functionality that we're showcasing through the prototype. Um, and of course, we're going to show you the URL for the prototype. It is live. It is, it is buggy. It is um, buggy. So. Um, as you go through it, and we, we would love for you to explore it um, and find typos, thank you, Brian, uh, <laughs> or missing words. Um, but right now, um, it's more of an experiment in showing the functionality of it. And we're going to go through and um, do some house cleaning in preparation for um, pursuing implementation and bridge funding um, uh, applications soon. So um, the, some of the basic functionality, um, so using maps and layers as navigational tools for the entire site promoting an exploration and nonlinear content interaction. Um, when I sat down with a web developer to kind of talk about what this should look like, we had all these great ideas. And Tony and um, our colleagues, Steve Bransford and Michael Page, had these awesome ideas and um, approaching what kind of content could be created. We'd have videos, and we'll talk more about this. We'll have um, you know, maybe some sound eventually. We'll have images. We'll have maps. We'll have these drone, um, like drone footage um, put together. But how are, how are people going to interact with this? What does it mean to have an online atlas? What does that even mean? So we sat down and we thought about this for a long time. Um, we had a lot of um, napkins that were drawn upon to figure out what it means to do this. Um, and we thought, you know, it's, if an atlas is, um, you know, infotainment at, 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 or, yeah, in some degree to get people interested, it has to be visually appealing to get, you know, the general public who wouldn't necessarily come to the site interested. It also has to have the meat in there as well. It's a scholarly resource, um, an educational tool. Um, and it has to somehow rely on, on the maps. Um, and so one of the things we decided to do is make the maps a navigation. So we have a, a standard sidebar navigation to help you cruise through different parts of the site. But the map comes up at every point possible um, to allow you to freely navigate and non-linearly through the site. Um, through the map, you can access all of the different content types of the site. You can also access different map layers for comparison um, and exploration. And through the map, you can, um, of course, access the long-form textual content as well, um, as well as zooming in and out and exploring different islands of the Georgia coast. Do you want to see this? Yeah, the map idea was essential, again, for this primary goal of giving 
a sense of place. And then uh, with the other content, with photographs, video, panoramas, which we'll show you some of those, all of that then is connecting to how that place has changed through time, and particularly from the context of human interactions with the landscape. Yeah, and I will say, um, you know, one part of the site that's kind of the about the site portion where we do some explanation and we kind of have that siloed off so um, you can find that information whenever you need to. Um, you know, we're aware that um, map is not territory and that, um, you know, the maps we choose have, we chose them for specific reasons. So right now we have some base maps um, that are here to showcase like basic functionality, but as we go through all of our maps will be listed and the reasons we're using them, where they've come from, what it means to use that map, um, you know, you can, ex we're, we'll show you the methodology behind that as well. So. Um, secondly, the annotated panoramas that Tony talked about, and we'll show you these in the, in the full site. But um, we have some fabulous drone footage. Part of it is we said that we could give this presentation and just show you drone footage, and you'd probably be just as happy. Um, there are some really beautiful things, and we've been blessed with um, one drone uh, with at least nine lives, if not more. <laughs> um, taking drones out into the field is um, dangerous. Um, so <laughs> for the drones, not we're fine. Um, but what these do, um, we are working with Panator to annotate panoramas, stitch them together, and we, so we have um, aerial shots and we also have 360 degree panoramas. And we can link the two to allow you to explore not only through the map, but through the panoramas so that, and you'll see this later, if you're in one aerial view, you can connect to another panorama showing you a 360 view of something nearby. And you can actually traverse the island through that way, um, connecting back, back to a map that shows you where you are. Um, and then um, the drone, use of the drone video has also provided us a unique perspective on what's on the island. Um, and so not only does it provide pretty pictures um, and some nice panoramas that we can later annotate, but it becomes itself um, uh, a source for additional analysis. And Tony can say more about that. Yeah, this is a plantation site, for instance. And I could look at that through, say, Google Earth, or I could look at photographs of it. Uh, from the ground, and I've been there many, many times with Emory students, and we've looked up close at the buildings. But this new perspective we gain from the drone footage and being able, especially with 3D panoramas, to look at it from a different way adds another dimension to our study and teaching of it, too. And, I, and it really is transforming the way I think about teaching my courses that connect with the Georgia coast in the future. Um, and finally, so um, as far as the map goes, um, you know, we can use map layers in Leaflet, and that's our tool of choice at the moment, um, to show, to allow you uh, to experience uh, what it means to use different maps, what it means to analyze historic maps um, with contemporary maps and different map layers showing shorelines, for example. Um, there's some LiDAR data that I think we're hoping to bring in. Um, and we have as many maps as we can find, I think we're hoping to throw in. Um, right now, we're, we don't have that functionality live on the prototype, but we hope to have it up again soon. We had some problems with Leaflet. Um, but this is kind of an example of uh, some overlays of historical maps, and we hope to add um, more. And then Tony's famous tagline. <laughs> yeah, change is the only constant with barrier islands. It's a really cool concept to get across to students that these are dynamic places. And Hurricane Matthew just hit the Georgia coast. Uh, only just last month, and that was one of the first hurricanes to hit the coast since the 1950s. So with this project, our project is going to have to be dynamic along with the coast because it's constantly going to be changing. And one of the things we can do with maps, I think, that brings across that sense, uh, whether it's through the general public, our students, or ourselves as scholars, is through maps, that we can understand that change, looking historically how the islands change through time. Um, one of the other huge pieces of this, because um, one of the um, kind of, I don't know, co-creators of this project was Steve Bransford, who now works in the Center for Digital Scholarship at Emory um, as our mm -hmm. I don't know, production person, um, he who owns all things multimedia, uh, was the importance and um, thoughtfulness gained, uh, like put towards multimedia use in the site so that it would in fact hopefully t trend towards multimodal, thinking about communicating through multiple modes rather than displaying multimedia without that kind of tie-in. Um, and so we have some 
um, these were experiments, as I mentioned to the CDS staff this morning, that um, we were going to try and use some time time lapse functionality of our cameras to see what we could get. Um, and we ended up getting amazing um, uh, examples of some of the processes of change that over just a few hours on, on the coats. So I'll just go ahead and show this to you. The tide is coming in and it's rapidly wow. rising. This is because the Georgia coast is mesotidal. Mesotidal refers to a tidal range of two to four meters. And on the Georgia coast, the difference between low tide and high tide can approach three meters. What's going to happen with global climate change and sea level rise is that this mesotidal zone will eventually move toward the forest and include more trees in the surf. I think one of the videos that we don't have um, up here in the presentation, but it's on the site, is of um, the periwinkles you might have seen in the, in the beginning. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yeah, the time lapse uh, videos, it was, it was a brilliant idea on Steve's part, I think, to include those as part of the project. It's not something I would have thought of as a scholar. The amazing insights I got as a natural scientist out of those after they were done, and they were finicky and you have to invest yourself in doing them, so, and you don't know how it's going to turn out necessarily in the end. But the payoff for us was fantastic in that the a video, time last video done at the salt marsh gave me new insights and behavior of the snails that were grazing on the cord grass in the salt marsh that with all of my years of experience Working on the Georgia coast, I had never really had that insight before. And then being able to show uh, the video we just showed, to be able to have that 30-second clip in my classroom is visually, and then with the auditory aspects, going to be incredibly valuable for my students. They'll get it. When I talk about sea level rise and climate change, and they see this rapid rise of the coast and what was formerly land with a dead tree in the surf, all of that visual information is very rich in content. And so I see a great value out of this in my teaching as well. The other um, kind of uh, multimedia part of the site um, that was planned from the beginning were on-site informational videos where we would use Tony's fabulous talents, as Steve called him, the mm -hmm. one-take wonder. Um, Given that we had such a fabulous contact expert who is trained to, to be able to speak on camera so well um, and is a great pedagogue, um, we were able to get a lot of content and a lot of fabulous content on site. Uh, we went last September, and actually this, this is uh, our anniversary of, uh, Time Hop tells me this is my anniversary of putting all these Instagram photos up of our last trip to Sapelo. Um, and so Steve and I, um, and with occasional help of some of our other center staff, um, did a lot of videos in the field with Tony. Um, I can show you an example of what that looks like. This is a really good example of a ghost shrimp burrow. Ghost shrimp are burrowing shrimp that go down two to three meters below the sand surface here on the beach. But we're close to the top of the burrow here. The burrow is shaped kind of like a wine bottle, where you have a really thin aperture or chimney part that opens up into a larger living chamber where that shrimp spends most of its time. But this one we see is actively occupied because there has been some water pumped up by it. So it's close to the top. What's neat is that they pump out mud. So they're geologically important in that they're taking mud that's in the sandy areas, concentrated into these little pellets that look like chocolate sprinkles, and then depositing them outside their burrow. So geologists are very interested in this because this is how we think most mud gets deposited in these beach environments. When we look at a geologically old layer of rock that has lots of sand and little stringers of mud, we think it was something like this ghost shrimp that might have been depositing the mud in this high energy sandy environment. One take, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say anything about yeah, that? Yeah, and this is where I think if you're thinking of doing similar projects, uh, I would focus on faculty who have taught a lot, and they have taught undergraduate students a lot, and especially introductory level classes. So part of what I was bringing to this was that experience that I've taught undergraduate non-science majors uh, for a long time. Uh, my on-camera experience was with the great courses with the teaching company, so I had that media experience. But I also knew how to simplify in a way that was not being simplistic. 
and being able to condense information into that nice little sound bite sort of sequence so that you do stay, stay focused on it, but then the brilliant way I think Steve and other people doing the editing, the video editing, then also keeps your interest on it. That's where the digital content is essential. And then, so all of the things that I've talked about so far um, are, could be done in any sort of digital project. You can get some developers on it. They create some map layers for you on a website, and they throw all this multimedia content on it um, and maybe some markers. Um, the difficult part of this um, question of how do you create the atlas is the, is the long form content, the meat of the project. Um, and right now, um, we have some of, um, of Tony's blog posts about the coast um, as examples of what this could look like. And we're hoping to create specifically the peer reviewed um, portion of this. We would create an editorial board, um, create a workflow for um, soliciting articles, bringing them in. How does it work to peer review an article in this space? Um, and also maintain um, the multimedia, or the multimodal, I would say, part of it um, and the incorporation of the map to, um, in a long form article, maybe be able to show you where, uh, where, th where the article is referring to via the map. Um, and this is, this question is probably the one that's creating the most headache for us because it changes the platform that we might use. And so I'll talk a little bit more about this platform specifics later. Um, but it is kind of the most, it's most interesting part for me in terms of technological challenges of how do we make sure that we have this space um, for our content producers to be able to produce content without having to rely on developers who may or may not be uh, available. Um, and uh, the owners of the project may or may not have the funds to pay developers to kind of put this pro uh, content in for them. Can you just say anything more about that? Yeah, this was a, this was a way to take uh, what I had done originally as just informal blog posts that when my book about the Georgia coast came out, I set up a, a site in WordPress, and then I had regular blog posts. And part of that was promoting the book, but also it was public outreach. What was nice then was to be able to take that as a raw product, a raw, unprocessed, unedited type of product, and then have it edited by people from the Center for Digital Scholarship and then adapt it as content for the site. So that was a, that was a nice opportunity that we have. We had pre-existing raw content that then could be converted and appropriate more for approaching a scholarly type of content on the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the book I had mentioned, uh, Life Traces of the Georgia Coast, I published uh, a few years ago through Indiana University Press. It's about uh, almost 700 pages. It's about the, mostly the animals and the traces as shown in this beautiful painting by, by Alan Campbell, and how those animals interact with the, uh, the Georgia Bear Islands. I do have a chapter in there on human history and human interactions. So that's an important part of our project is, again, how the human interactions with the landscapes alter them in a way that I refer to it as the metaphor of a broken mirror, that we can look at those islands as modern environments, but they're not perfect reflecting, perfect reflectances of what may have happened in the pre-human past. Uh, so this was going to be a large part of our themes, our uniting themes in the project. I also, like I mentioned, that did the blog post, and I have the website, georgialifetraces.com. But I also do social media through uh, Facebook, set up a Facebook site about the book, as well as my, um, the next book, and then uh, Twitter, and uh, other, other ways of social media that now we're, I think, better coordinating with Center for Digital Scholarship mm -hmm. on doing social media outreach as well. Yeah, and I'll just jump in here that Tony's expertise here has really sh helped shape the prototype of the project, but we've all been in discussions from the beginning about the breadth and depth of the project. So, and we'll talk a little bit about, more about kind of the um, multidisciplinary approach that we hope that the Atlas, um, as it's implemented, will take. The uh, major benefit of taking so many students down to the George Bear Islands, which I've been doing since 1998, uh, biannually at least, sometimes more often than that, has been this uh, honing of the information that, like I mentioned earlier, connects really well then on camera, that taking the students out in the field and having to do these impromptu mini lectures of what's there, 
I can sometimes expect what's going to be there, but I'm constantly surprised by what I see there too. So it helps if you have some improv training as well, if you're going to do content with faculty on this. But what was, uh, what was great, uh, just one year ago, almost exactly at this time, this group of students that I had there on the coast, the crew, film crew from the Center for Digital Scholarship came with us, and we had that sort of mixing going on too. So I would urge if you did similar projects here at Brown, make sure you include students. Have students as part of it, whether it's teaching in the field, having them do research projects, providing content, or working with your, your media, for mm -hmm. instance. And one of the large problems with large digital projects that we talked about with the CDS staff this morning was that um, content is the huge variable that is it's not talked about enough at the project planning level, at least at the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship. Um, a lot of times people come in with these great ideas and everyone gets so excited about their plans, their initial ideas, all the technology we hope to put together. Everyone, oh, we're having such a wonderful moment. And then we have to create all of the content to make this website make any sense for a general public. Um, we could simply put a map up with a bunch of markers and then put some scholarly articles and that could be a thing. But in order for this website to do anything for the general public beyond the scholars who've written articles for this site, the site has to have more. And that means it has to have more content. It has to have more context. So who creates that? And so Tony had this wonderful idea, if you want to talk about that, to, for student involvement specifically for this problem. Yeah, next semester, for example, uh, I'm teaching my Barrier Islands class uh, that I normally teach biannually. But I probably am going to start teaching it every spring now. Because now with the project, I'm thinking that I can use the students to provide some of the content by they, they choose or I, I assign them an island and to do basic research on that island I'll have parameters of look for this information, geological, historical, human historical aspects and then put that together into a document that then we could be through peer review afterwards put onto the site. Now what's also going to be neat next semester is for the very first time in teaching this course, I can use this site as part of my teaching. So we get to test how well does it work with students mm -hmm. in a classroom, which gives us a sense of how well will this work in the outside world, outside of Emory or outside of academia in general. Because mm -hmm. our students are mostly, the demographics are 18 to 22 years old, if, and they're smart, they're motivated. But if they get it, then we're going to be fairly confident that more people who come to our site will also get it. Mm -hmm. This is kind of what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, kind of uh, demonstrates what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so moving on to the state of the project. Um, so there are 24 Georgia Barrier Islands, and that is the list with typos fixed. Thank yep. you, Tony. Um, right now, the prototype covers only Sapelo Island, really, with one or two um, pieces um, of media attached to St. Catharines Island. Um, the prototype um, has required, so the prototype team um, is about eight people total, about five core members, and, and then some assistants throughout, um, dedicated to these so field work trips. We've had two so far, um, and we plan to have one more in December and perhaps a few in the spring that some bridge funding will hopefully help uh, to make happen for us. Um, and then we have our, um, I said, you know, web developers. It's more like one and a half web developers. Um, from the proposal to prototype um, was seven months total to what you'll see here. And it's kind of been on, in stasis while we're doing this bridge funding search. Um, so we had four weekends of field work and three months of post-production and web development, and that's it. And we're pretty pleased with what we were able to put together with the limited resources that we had. Um, and like I said, we're currently seeking bridge funding um, to expand the project um, and get it ready for presenting it to funding agencies like the NEH um, and then some of the um, uh, coastal management um, funding applications that are up right now. Um, and additionally, we're also right now We'll be starting to focus on the creation of an editorial board for the peer review process and then sitting down to create a workflow, um, create a vision for the peer review part of this atlas with that editorial board. Um, and so some of the folks that we've um, been in contact with through um, 
uh, conferences on the Georgia coast and things like that. Who've, we have some interviews with them that are on the site, and Tony can talk about that in a moment. We're hoping to engage some of those folks who work outside of our areas of expertise to bring their voices to the Atlas and hopefully become um, the, I guess, the, the first editorial board for this new publication. Why Sapelo? And when I was asked uh, by the co-director of Center for uh, Digital Scholarship, Alan Tullis, what island would you pick, I didn't hesitate. I said Sapelo. And the reason why is because Sapelo has this long history connected to modern ecology. Starting in the 1950s, the University of Georgia Marine Institute was founded there. Uh, and all of the seminal research had been done there in modern ecology. Also, a lot of geology was done there. And my advisor from the University of Georgia had done uh, some groundbreaking work there in the 1970s through 80s. So we had that, but there's also really good evidence of people having been there for a minimum 4,500 years. There's a Native American shell ring, Gwali shell ring that's on the north end of the island, for instance, that we have incorporated into the prototype <coughs> as evidence of human habitation that long ago. But then there was the plantation era with the post-European colonization that modified the landscapes and that's, that's an interesting aspect of itself. And then we have people who are still descended from enslaved people living on the island. So an African American community there, a Gullah Geechee culture, that's still extant on the island. So it's also logistically very easy to get there, relatively speaking. I, I'm talking as a field scientist. <laughs> <laughs> very easy to get there. We stay at the Marine Institute, which has electricity and a roof overhead and running water and full kitchens. That doesn't get better than that. <laughs> so that also made it amenable for us to be able to take down all of this digital intensive equipment mm -hmm. <laughs> and be able to recharge that equipment and be able to use it then in the field each day. Yeah, so more about uh, the shell ring. We do have this Native American presence there for a long time. The Georgia coast is world famous for some of the research that's been done, not just on Sapelo, but St. Catharines Island. And there's an example there from St. Catharines of fire tempered to a pottery, some of the oldest pottery in North America, credited to Native Americans from that long ago. So this shows you that people have been there a long time. This is very eye-opening for my students when I take them there and we go to the shell ring with this cross section through it, that they understand that this is not a pristine landscape. And then with the African American presence there, that's also fascinating for students and also people connecting to the island. There's a fair amount of tourism of people who come there for tours where people in the Hog Hammock Gullah community take people on guided tours. And this is uh, Yvonne Grobner here. She's a master weaver. She learned through probably the last eight or nine generations of people who have lived on Sapelo these skills uh, from originally connecting to Western Africa. The tabby ruins that are there also connect to the plantation era. So when we take students there or we have it on the platform, that also is conveying that still living history, but that connection to the past and not so distant past on the island. So in terms of like how did we create this prototype and what are, the, what are our hopes for the actual platform when we develop it, um, just a few factoids. So um, the prototype is built in um, Emory's Amazon web space. Um, and it's hand coded in Bootstrap um, because we needed to get it up and running quickly to have something to show with the work we were doing um, for grant funding purposes. Um, like I said, the the actual platform that can house this type of information in the way that we want to show it to folks, we, the way that we want it to function, there's nothing out there that does that yet. We need something um, that's robust um, to handle the maps, but also friendly enough for content production. We want our content producers to focus on content, not on learning HTML. So, uh, but for now, to show you all the prototype, uh, myself and Sandra Barrett, our web developer, coded this up in Bootstrap nice and quick. Um, which is fabulous. Uh, we loved the experience. Uh, we're using leaflet maps um, to create the navigable map layers, and um, it went down. Leaflet maps like um, had an update recently, and so actually if Thursday last week the website wasn't functional because they changed something about leaflet. So we have it updated, but it's a little buggier than usual. I'm hoping that 
by the end of the semester, kind of mid-December, the website should have a lot of the bugs fixed. Um, as I mentioned before, for the panoramas, the annotation and the output, we use Panotour, which is um, a really, it's a pretty easy program to use, very honestly, for annotating panoramas. I'm not a panorama stitcher by any means. I can't speak to that, but we didn't really have to do that much for this project, thank goodness. Um, the web development process uh, between Sandra and I, um, a small enough team, but we wanted to do it right. Uh, we used Pivotal Tracker to create our user stories, um, and between the both of us, we had, we created some kind of a custom sprint-like um, development workflows. Um, and we did the project management in Trello um, for the greater project. Um, what we hope to do as far as um, what will happen in the spring and moving forward is that we're going to move this into a custom hybrid WordPress platform. We are huge proponents um, of WordPress at, at the Anna Center for Digital Scholarship. And if, I think, what did I start at the, um, at the keynote speak, like, for the keynote speaker at like the library publishing forum, I asked this huge question in which I completely just like openly came out and said, I don't like Drupal. Um, I like WordPress and that kind of like, you know, eased the audience a little bit. I'm happy to talk platforms all day long and I have all <laughs> kinds of opinions that I'm gonna hold back on saying right now. But in the end, we did choose WordPress for the reason that it's easy to use. We have, um, we support WordPress generally at the CDS, but um, we also have um, Scholar Blogs, which is a multi-site instance of WordPress for use for the Emory community. Um, so if, we can, if people have already worked in Scholar Blogs, they can come in and they can add content to the Georgia Coast Atlas. Um, we can easily train other faculty members, um, other scholars who are interested in um, giving their time to creating content for the site. Um, we can train them in WordPress pretty easily. It's easy to maintain with respect to other platforms, and so we really want to leverage that for the content creation. But WordPress is not great at handling humongous map databases is not what it's meant for. So we're hoping to construct a hybrid WordPress platform that uses an external database um, for the map intensive work. So that's coming soon, we hope. <laughs> All right, so now a little tour of the actual Atlas. Best viewed in Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> So there we hey, it's, it's on my screen. No. That's not good. Get it over there. there yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So um, this is the georgiacoastatlas.org. Feel free to go there. If you go on your phone, <coughs> I am eager to hear about your experience. Mm -hmm. um, we did some minimal um, mobile testing when we kind of pause development on the Georgia Coast Atlas. Um, so I'd be curious to hear about your experiences on it, but it's not really mobile ready. I wouldn't say it's mobile ready. We haven't done enough testing. Um, so from the get-go, we wanted to give um, some, I guess, opportunities for people to explore the website in specific ways. So for the prototype, um, this is gonna be fun, uh, we give people um, options to explore the islands or learn more about the project. So when we come to learn more about the project, we have a basic description of, um, of the project there. Um, I'll show you our team later. Um, we have some information about the islands. And you know, to take a few moments to talk about this part of the site, um, as the prototype, when we're going and giving an application um, for grant funding, we're using the, the website a little bit here as an appendix to the application to put all the wonderful information in which we could include in an application here. Um, and this is kind of what this section of the prototype functions right now. Um, we were able to, and you can say more about this actually. Yeah, what we came up with uh, as an idea to include in the Atlas was uh, mm -hmm. for the very first time um, in Savannah, Georgia, there was a Georgia coastal nature and culture conference with uh, keynote speakers who were brought in, who were scholars in various aspects of the Georgia coast. What we were able to arrange then with the conference coordinators was to have interviews with them. And so I wrote interview questions ahead of time that connected to our project in terms of human, um, human cultural but natural history connections to the coast. And then the scholars of these uh, very different backgrounds, but how they all overlapped with common <coughs> themes of our project. Uh, this was extremely successful, and then the uh, the editing of the 
of the interviews. The interviews sometimes were 30 to 45 minutes long, but we edited them down to two to five minute videos so that you can get some of the essence of what these scholars were about. And we're hoping to tease these scholars into creating some content for it, initial content for us, or perhaps becoming a part of the editorial board. This is kind of, this page is to showcase the, that we're thinking more broadly about the project, but because one of our, I mean, Tony's expertise is fabulous, but it is only in one area, though he does have <laughs> many talents <laughs> and has done a lot. Um, but, the, but we do want to acknowledge that our, our focus is broad. And so, um, did you want to show? Yeah, let's show uh, maybe uh, yeah, Taya, Taya, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because these were people. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was just going to say before we see this clip, uh, the only person I had met out of these six scholars was uh, well Janice Ray, who's in Georgia, and uh, she's a she's a well-known southeastern naturalist writer. Um, but otherwise, I didn't know anybody else. Um, so giving them the questions ahead of time, I think, was essential so that they could come up with very good responses and be spontaneous on camera so that's in, intriguing. Mm -hmm. But also me coming coming in as a natural scientist, my main goal was to ask a question. You don't hear me on any of these videos. You hear them. Well, the Canadian Solomon Northrop's narrative used to say by how the environment was such a barrier for them? I hadn't really thought in the past about the natural world um, being a part of the imprisonment of African American race. That planters, overseers could count on the threats posed by the natural world, drowning or you know, attacks by wild animals, as being a part of the infrastructure of containment. But at the same time, the natural world could be an ally for enslaved people. And that does take us to the story of Dunbar Creek and the Evil Uprising, which goes back to an events of 1803 when a number of Igbo slaves were brought to Dunbar Creek on St. Simon's Island and knowing that they were going to be going to a life of bondage, decided to reject that future. And they did so by basically capsizing the ship. Two of the white men who were working on the ship, who were helping to transport them, jumped off the boat and uh, ended up dying. And the enslaved Igbo members of that group also jumped into the water, and many of them died. But the interpretation of their story that comes out of African American folklore is that they didn't simply drown, but that instead they flew away back home to Africa. So in this case, I think that that natural place in the land, that creek, is an inspiration for thinking about how people can resist inhuman treatment, how they can resist a lifetime of bondage. They can do it by, in this case, joining their lives up with the life of the natural world. And oh, um, I encourage everyone to, if they have the time to take a look at these clips, um, all, everyone here was amazing and had amazing stories. It was, um, these, these scholars and, and writers, um, the, it was a fabulous day of, of interviews and I'm grateful to have been part of the film team to do this. Um, we are hoping that this showcases that we, we want to have a variety of voices as a part of this project. Um, and here you can kind of hear them in their own words. Um, As well as having um, this kind of example here, we have um, a part of the atlas where we give some, what we're hoping to do is give some basic information on how to use the atlas. Um, part of it is we want to think about um, accessibility, and we're hoping to have more to say about that sooner than later. Um, transcripts of the videos will be important, but we're also thinking about, and I was mentioned, we were talking just earlier about this, how do you make the map experience accessible? We've been thinking so much about this map interactivity. How do you do that? I don't have an answer for you now, but it is something that we're in discussions with, um, and we're hoping, we're doing an accessibility um, workshop with, uh, with folks across Atlanta in the spring, and we're hoping to, to start tackling this question a little more. Um, 
at, at the front of our list. But here, um, I mentioned earlier that one of the things we, we hope to do is actually have information about the maps we're using to showcase why we've chosen the map layers that we have, why we've chosen the base maps that we have, um, and have that up here um, so that people see that, that um, what we're showing is not, uh, I go back to that, that quote that I love, the map is not territory. We're not displaying um, facts out of context here. Um, that these maps mean something. And in choosing some of these maps, we were fascinated to learn that some of the, the um, geolocated spots on some of the maps were in the middle of water, and on some of them were in, on land. Um, and so map layers make a difference. And so um, we're hoping that this uh, will grow as we put more map layers up and have more information for users there. Um, so jumping to, um, so over here is this uh, minimalist sidebar menu, which is here for a reason. Um, and so when you come to the atlas, the first thing that you should see is the atlas itself. And so um, the little eye is for information. And as you come to the flag here, you start to see the islands. And we wanted to make our, our general navigation map on this side as minimalist as possible to keep your focus on the map as navigation. Um, so what we hope to have here is this filled out, of course. As I mentioned, there are lots of islands. Uh, right now, we only have um, a few pieces of information for St. Catharines, but the majority of the working site is on Sapelo Island. Um, and eventually, you'll be able to come up here to this layers region here and select a number of different layers to display some different base maps. And then you should be able to actually navigate by island by hovering over it. And right now, with the leaflet update, that's not functional, but we hope to get that up and running again soon. So if you want to come over to explore Sapelo, which we encourage that you do, you'll find this fabulous um, drone video which was playing at the beginning. Um, perhaps Tony's students will create some of this basic content to tell you about Sapelo Island in the spring. Um, over here, you see you have the map um, always present. Uh, with all of the content that's been developed for Sapelo Island, um, and up here at the top, um, you can always come back to the main map. Of course, it's not centered right now. Did I mention bugs? I mentioned bugs, right? OK. Um, but you can always, and then you can toggle that back and forth, which is what we always, what we wanted. Um, and you can traverse the islands through this uh, map pane over here. With any of the long form content pieces, any, actually any of the content pieces on the site, um, we have related content to the island or to the topic of that piece um, at the bottom. So here, this is all the things we have currently available related to Sapelo Island. Um, we have pr plenty of tagging as well. So, um, and here you should be able to also um, toggle on and off content pieces, but on and off a map specific to the island you're looking at. Um, coming back over here to the map, um, you'll see that large map where you can, you should be able to, by the end of it, traverse the islands looking for different pieces of content um, in a nonlinear way. Whatever moves you, go ahead and do it. Um, and what we will eventually have to do is work on um, zooming in and being able to see more detailed content. Because theoretically, a couple more trips to Sapelo Island, and you can see how this could fill up really quickly and make it quickly unusable. Um, so we're aware of that as kind of a, uh, an issue we have to explore. So you see there are different types of content. The markers and the colors, the icons are repeated throughout the site um, to try to train the user on how to use this um, atlas. So, um, but for example, if you wanted to look at only the long form content articles, you could come over here to this orange marker. And then um, you'll see only the content, only the long form content for the site. And we can go check out one of those pieces that Tony's written. Yes, I would love to read an article on fossils in progress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here's a blog post that we adapted for this format. Um, we have some fabulous images um, that were pulled from our field research and kind of thrown into the piece that Tony had already written to kind of display the, the possibilities here. Um, and this is still pretty limited. Um, we're hoping that people will take um, the possibilities the open possibilities and run with them. Um, so these are just some examples. And you can see here that um, this marker showcases where you are. And so we're looking at some pieces that actually, as you scroll through, and the, and the, uh, the author has written about different portions of the island, as you scroll through, the map will take you to those places and show you pieces of content that we have around that area on the island. Um, additionally, we have our awesome pano tours. Um, so we'll take you in to see a few of those and what those look like on Cabretta Beach. Um, we have this aerial. 
And this was made using Panotour. And so here, see that functionality is working here. I don't know why it's not working elsewhere, but um, you can enter full screen. Oh, this looks. Wow. We really need one of these boards. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed with us. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> looks great. Um, and so, for example, you're like, I don't really know what a relic marsh is. Tony Martin, why don't you tell me? Uh, sure. A relic marsh is a sedimentary deposit formed originally as a salt marsh. These are typically hundreds of years old, and unless compacted, it still retains remnants of its original ecosystem. See, you didn't even see my lips. It is, yeah, it's fabulous. Um, and so you can see how something like this could function within a piece itself um, as um, additional ways to, um, to analyze data like this by actually putting it in the image, but also for, um, for basic education about what these areas look like for younger crowds for K-12. Um, one of the fun parts that we're exploring is not only being able to annotate these panoramas, but being able to link them. So if you see over here on the left, uh, we have um, go to the Cabretta 360 tour, which don't mind if I do. So we come over to this area, um, which we'll have the marker over here. And we can go again full screen. I'm going to change my control mode here. Uh, minimal controls, because Panotour can do too many things. And then you can actually explore <coughs> Cabretta Beach from this vantage point. And this was kind of a, a quick and dirty panorama that Michael Page created for us. Um, and we should have more, you know, zooming available when he does this. But he's like, oh, by the way, guys, I made a 360 thing. Would this be great? And we, as soon as we linked them, we're like, yes, we want you to do more yes. of these. And the hope is that over here, you can see the go to Cabretta Beach, and that's the aerial we just looked at, is that we should be able to connect these pieces pieces of the island together via the panoramas. So over here, eventually, Blackbeard? Yeah. Is that <laughs> still learning? Island. That you can travel to the islands via these, these panoramas. And of course, we'll have content here explaining what you're seeing. Some basic stuff right now, but we have to have more robust content soon. Um, we also have some basic galleries. And these are just galleries to show the functionality of having a gallery in this space. They're not exactly, um, they don't have any analysis attached to them, and they're a little bit random at the moment. But for example, this is the Barrow Pit, uh, which Tony could tell you a little bit about. Yeah, freshwater, artificial freshwater environment with some of its denizens. Yeah, <laughs> and so this is just a showcase that we can, in fact, house um, gallery content on here um, for different spots of the site. So there's the Nature Trail, and you saw the periwinkles before. And finally, um, the video content, which we have a lot of, and I'll just show an example of it here. Um, so you can scroll in and kind of come to a piece of the island you'd want to learn more about. And if we have video content, um, you can click on it, and yeah. you can learn a little bit about that. I'm always excited to find SCAT. SCAT is an indicator of animal <laughs> presence. It tells us uh, not only an animal was here, but also what it was eating. This is a prime example of scat. It's a very large example of scat <laughs> from a species that does not belong here on Saplo Island. It's from cattle. There are feral cattle on the island that have been living here since at least, I think, the mid 20th century. And they've been living wild in the forest and foraging along the edges of the salt marshes ever since. I rarely see them on the island. It's amazing to think that you would not see cattle because we're so used to seeing them out in the fields. Mm -hmm. But these are uh, wild cattle. They are shy of people, and you often do not see them when you visit Saplo for, say, two or three days. So it's always exciting for me to find a scat pile, especially this big, to tell me that there was a large adult that was probably in the area. Now, because we're on the south end of the island, this is probably from a bull. Because the herds of the cattle are much more commonly seen or you find their scat in the north end of the island. So when I see this isolated as just one instance in an area where I normally don't see their sign, it makes me think that this is from a wandering rogue bull that went through here probably, it looks like, a couple of weeks ago. And then you spotted so, it when? So, I had some, some, some stories about finding yeah. that bull. <laughs> it was unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, um, so you saw there he kind of gets ready to go. And at that point, <laughs> having gone to India enough times to understand when a bull gets angry, I threw down my camera and ran yeah. um, <laughs> But that's OK. Um, so 
Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. that's what drones mm -hmm. are for. Mm -hmm. So um, kind of flipping through here. Um, just to wrap up, because I think we're out of time, um, this is the, the prototype team. Um, of course, there, uh, we have Tony Martin being one of the leaders of the project, but Michael Page and Steve Bransford were um, some of the, the, the brain team behind this project as well. Uh, Dr. Tullis, they're the co-director of ECDS, um, is a huge supporter of the project. And then we have kind of our production team there. Shannon O'Daniel helped with some of the project management and video editing for this prototype. I've been with it from the beginning, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm with it till the end um, with various hats. Um, Sandra Barrett um, is the magic maker um, behind the development of the site, and Alan Pike, um, who's now off in, in consultant land uh, doing all sorts of great things, um, helped with some of the videography. So um, feel free to go and play around, and remember, it's a prototype. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. So we would love all sorts of questions, conversations, oh. anything. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, I, I had a question about um, general audiences and digital monographs. And this is from a public humanities context that will come up yeah, the center there. And I, I guess I'm, uh, I know you're at the prototyping stage, but I'm curious about like beyond the, the sort of like the clean interface, like what kind of user stories are you sort of um, have in mind for like who is coming to visit this site and how does this sort of general audience get more specific? Uh, you know, in, in those contexts, mm -hmm. what are the contexts sort of surrounding <coughs> engagement with the site? Are you thinking of going to classrooms, sort of doing, going to public libraries, um, and, you know, thinking about tying it into more explicitly a conversation about climate change or, or slavery and, and issues like that? And then also, like, I think more generally, like, how does this sort of, like, monograph model in this digital context actually kind of, like, create tensions with, like, the way that um, a lot of people use the web, like you have one tab open, I usually have 10 tabs open, right? Oh, I this normally stuff do too. <laughs> you know, like I can see like, the, like I want to put the ghost room video on Facebook, right? Because I thought that was like really cool. So like how, yeah. like, how, how do we sort of use these spaces and like, um, and, and you want to be deep and sort of meaty with the content and you want to make sure you get the melon funding or the funding from whoever and you want to make sure you get tenure if you work on it and stuff. But like how also like, might there be limits to, to this or, or things to work through? So it's just kind of a, like an ideal of this stuff too. So just yeah. curious as to what your thoughts are. Yeah. Um, so a lot there. Um, I guess as far as the audiences, I can start with that from just the how do we approach digital projects a little bit at, at ECDS um, with the question of audiences. And this is the hardest thing to get projects to focus on. They're like, we want to put all this stuff up because wouldn't it be great to have all this stuff online for people to get? And then they leave the room and then you're like, what just happened here? Who is this for? <laughs> um, and we are keenly aware of that. And when we've gone to talk about this for funding agencies and are now reflecting on this for grant proposals, um, we're trying to be really clear that we, and it sounds so bad because I make fun of people, like when we say, oh, this should be for everyone. And we're like, huh, well, what does that mean? And they're like, no, but I mean, we kind of do want it for multiple audiences. We do want it to be used in schools. And so part of it is that we need to have that kind of content there. Um, that's accessible that can be used in the classroom. We would love to have some curriculum material built around this in partnership with folks in, Atlanta, in and around Atlanta and in around the coast um, and actually partner with them to create that content and have it available on the site. Um, and so that about the site portal right now is just some basic information, but we hope to actually make that more robust to showcase some of that. And you can actually go into, you know, maybe a pedagogy section of the site to help you create that curricula for the site. But also we have this, the scholars, and this is supposed to be, you know, a form of scholarship for those folks who want to go in and, and create articles for and read articles from this atlas. And so there are multiple um, audiences that play there, and you can access that. And so those students maybe in high school who are doing a project on the coast, they can access that material without having to pay for it because maybe their school doesn't have access to those scholarly journals. So we're hoping that actually there's an overlap in audiences and that you start off in one place um, because maybe you're a tourist and you don't know what a relic marsh is, and then you end up in one of Tony's pieces learning about scat. You never know. So the, the open part of it is kind of relinquishing control from putting too many, ab creating storylines um, that are embedded in the site that keep people from crossing over. Um, I think that we, we're trying to be um, 
We want to acknowledge the nonlinear kind of beauty of it and chaos of it when we're building the user stories. So for example, when Sandra and I sat down to do, put together the prototype, we were imagining how you would navigate these map layers. And one of the things is like you always want to come back to this and have everything available. Um, depending on Zoom levels, we're going to get to that. But um, so that you can cross from different paths. And that helps to answer some of that question. But then also in terms of um, the, the scholars and the, the breadth of, of the content, if you want to speak to that. Too. Yeah, and I think uh, there's a long tradition from what I understand in psychology of so many psychology studies that have been done on college students. <laughs> well, I think we're going to be able to do that next semester is that I'll be able to have my university students at Emory in the Barry Islands class. We'll test this on them. They'll be kind of the testers mm -hmm. of yeah, how well testers. does this work as, for them as a user. Mm -hmm. And I'll be able to tabulate results from that. How well did that work for them? What didn't work? Mm -hmm. And we'll keep that in mind uh, with regard to asking that question, is this for everybody? Uh, but uh, one of our main goals is to connect especially with educators. So as Anadi said, uh, educators who are especially on the coast or near the coast how can they connect their students, K through 12 students, for instance, with what's going on? Mm -hmm. So that's part of how we're, we're going to keep it both high and low in terms of the content for accessibility. I think that's, that's going to be a balance yeah. that we're going to be working on. And additionally, in terms of the partners that we're looking to, to help us not only create the content, but get the content out there and give us feedback about who this is for. And if you want to say a few things about the 100 miles folks in the Yeah, partnership. so we have a, we've been getting into agreements or connections with various coastal uh, nonprofit organizations. And there's one in particular that we formalized a connection with them, have a memo of understanding with them called 100 miles. The Georgia coast is about 100 miles long. It's um, one third of all the salt marshes in the eastern U.S. are on the Georgia coast in that hundred miles. And many of these islands were owned by the robber barons of the late 19th and early 20th century. So they are relatively undeveloped islands, unlike <coughs> just south of here or north of here. <laughs> so this is, I think, an opportunity for us to connect with those environmental groups that are trying to preserve and conserve what's uh, there on the Georgia coast, which are natural resources that are also are going to have ecosystem services that are going to give back to the communities there and far into the future. That's an excellent question about audiences, and it's something that all of our projects have, have an ongoing problem with. It's not something that you get an answer to once. It's an ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to ask about the, uh, give, given your purpose, it seems like it's primarily in educational purpose, that's how I understand it. It's not particularly a research purpose. There's research that has gone into it, but really what you're providing is an introduction to research, to a research area and a domain. So that makes me wonder why you've talked about a peer review process and an editorial board. I could understand having an advisory board to help you think through what kinds of materials should be here, how to, how to present it, how it might develop in the future. But a peer review seems to be reaching in a different direction than an educational purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, the question of content creation um, is, as I, I mentioned before, um, it's a huge hurdle for some of these projects. Um, Tony is only but one person with one specific area of expertise. Um, and we need content to be created for this, and it's not coming out of the center. So how to create a robust site that's going to bring in a variety of voices um, and incentivize scholars to interact with the site in that way is kind of going through this peer-reviewed model. Is that um, you know they get um, you know the peer-reviewed journal piece for institutional purposes um, that that's needed for tenure review. Um, we're aware of that. So we we're just talking earlier with CDS stuff. How do you incentivize faculty? And that may be one way um, to create some of the content for this site to make it a living monograph, if you will. So you it, are, you, you, are you going to be competing with alternative ways to publish this kinds of material? Are you going to be providing a place where a different kind of material could be published and get a mm -hmm. seal of approval of peer review? Mm -hmm. which, which is it? Because there's yes. a question, why go to the trouble of trying to establish 
uh, a reputation as a peer review cited mm -hmm. source, like a journal, mm -hmm. uh, if people could publish the work alternatively somewhere else, and then, and then you could just use it. Uh, so this is an interesting thing, because right now um, Tony's writing some pieces about this project, and it's being um, funneled through Southern Spaces as a peer-reviewed journal, because there's no, there's no place for this. For you to write about the Georgia coast um, in the context of, this, of the coast and the issues we're hoping to address with the project at large, is there a space for that right now? Yeah, it is original research, what we're doing here in taking this ecological, geological history of an island and then connecting it to how the landscape has been affected by people and uh, how those interact with one another. Other people have worked on that. I'm thinking of uh, Yifu Tuan and other <laughs> scholars who have worked on those perspectives. But what we're trying to do is look at a specific place. And from this, we think we're going to get original research and maybe inspire some mm -hmm. other scholars to come in yeah. and do peer-reviewed original research that's not just repackaging what maybe I've already done or other people have done. But to your point about can they maybe do something different in this platform, mm -hmm. yes. So um, not that we wouldn't say no to a, a traditional text piece with no images, but somehow tied to a specific location on the Georgia coast. But what we're hoping is that the open nature and that we're trying to craft from the beginning with intent, a multimodal site, is that people will start to create different types of content that they can't house anywhere else. So as I mentioned, Southern Spaces, which an article about the Georgia coast, we would think, ah, oh, why don't you send it to Southern Spaces? Well, hopefully, um, and, well, um, and it may have a, a picture or two, or perhaps <coughs> a video of a presentation. It's not a multimodal site. You can put multimedia on it. But how do you create a, an experience like that? We're hoping that um, pieces that will come into the Atlas will make the most of this platform, what it can do in terms of a display, like in terms of communicating their, their research. So um, I don't know if that helps to answer your question more towards the latter, that yes, we do hope people will take uh, advantage of this platform. But for the former, do we hope to compete, or are we hoping to compete with traditional forms of publishing? I think that um, having a, a journal for the Georgia coast, for example, if we came and we were just talking about a traditional textual journal for the Georgia coast, um, I don't know if, if you'd have that same question there. What we're hoping to do is create a home for that type of content around the Georgia coast. And it's, I don't necessarily see it as competing, I guess. And does that answer your question? I get the idea. Okay. Oh. Yeah. 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 Um, you have a, a lot of really marvelous resources collected, the articles, the videos, and so on and so forth. And you're presenting them in a way that's sort of unique to this medium. Um, however, this will not continue to work. Mm -hmm. Of course. And so, um, do you have a, a plan for archiving what you can archive and preserving what you can preserve mm -hmm. in a repository? So, we um, have just started a working group within um, the Center for Digital Scholarship about the questions of archiving the sites. And given that the, the Atlas is one of our flagship projects, that means that we are invested in it for the long term. It, it lives in our center. I mean, it lives in an Amazon web space, but that's ours. Um, so we're invested in this question as well. Right now, I don't have an answer for you of like how we archive this site. But I think that we see it as um, it needs to evolve as the technology evolves. So one of the things that, and this comes from my training. I you know, was in an R&D center for three years. Um, you know, I was in an agile group and we did sprints all together and held hands. And so I'm a little, the way that I think of projects is different from the rest of the, of the center staff. I don't see projects as necessarily dying off within a few years, um, but that they need to be continually kept up and maintained and they need to be versioned, if you will. Um, and then at, at some point you come to the, at the end of the life of the project, which hopefully for this one won't be for a long time. Um, and then you need to just, discuss like how do you archive a project. But this is completely different from some of our other sites that are more textual based. So how do you, uh, how do you wrap this project up should the technology just move on and it's a, the out, and, an online atlas has to use something else. Something else is better has come up for this. So um, I see the project is more evolving, but as far as its end of life, we don't have an answer for that one yet. So, but we are aware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> 
a developer and when I see, and I love maps, and when I see things I sometimes think, how would I do that not, not knowing how to do it? How would I do sure. it? Yeah. And I was thinking, um, you know, in, 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 Google's, in the Google Street View, whenever you see something, you always see a little icon to mm -hmm. the right that kind of angles, so you have a sense of context. Mm -hmm. So I was imagining when you said that you want to be able to have a linkage that if you're looking at a certain photograph, you can see the context, um, mm -hmm. you can see the context. And I was imagining, so the, the points of metadata might be <coughs> the geolocation, the direction, the compass direction mm -hmm. that one is facing, mm -hmm. and then maybe a sense of scale for panoramas. Mm -hmm. so, I so that makes mm -hmm. me ask you all, um, what kinds of um, metadata have you started to maybe require this. that all, input, all, all me incoming media mm -hmm. have, or how has that evolved? What surprises have you, what, what, have you had to, what have you thought of and then had to go back and retroactively, you know, get? Yeah, I think the, the most interesting product in terms of making, and I, from what I can speak to, making the prototype um, was that, um, you know, geolocating each spot. So, you know, each of these spots, like for example, we had a number of photos and, you know, we had a record of where, where those happened. Um, as I mentioned before, part of the, part of the problem was that um, our maps sometimes, because we're in, the, we're in the middle of nowhere, and <laughs> most of these. So the maps, like, aren't that, aren't that great. And so some of these those spots, <laughs> for example, I can show you one of the problems. Um, we're, uh, I, I took video here, and I was not in the middle of the water. And so, <laughs> um, and if you choose one of the other open street maps, which are our current two base maps options, um, all of a sudden, some of them, now you're on land. And th this is part of the problem. What do you use as your base map? And so I can't see necessarily the, the metadata. All, you know, all we really have are, are just locations right now. Um, but part of the problem is, like, what are you putting those on? <laughs> it became this huge surprise of what does it mean to use the base map, which is why I've made kind of a big deal of we need to show why we're using such maps that we are. Um, so I, th I can speak to that as being a surprise in terms of what data we have, what metadata is associated with these points, and um, not realizing that we don't have the maps to support them, maybe also. So. Now the drone footage, it's all tied into mm -hmm. yeah. GIS. Yeah. So but it's interesting to note kind of your directionality and, um, in terms of that being additional kind of metadata for each of these points. Um, I think would be awesome, especially for the drone footage and the panoramas, because your specific orientation matters. And if you're going to be linking these things, it would be very easy uh, to get completely lost in that. Um, and so that's, I, I ha that's awesome. And we hadn't thought about that yet, that's honestly. Question, so that's yeah. Ask our geographer. <laughs> yeah, and also, um, and, it, and just to give us something else to think about. Just yeah. a small point in there. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. has the yeah, yeah. And so we have, well, mm -hmm. we have a lot of it, but the only thing that's being used in the site are the actual locations. So, because right now all we needed to do is put the points down. Um, but, um, and, and we're only beginning to work with Leaflet, um, you know, and that's really Sandra's homeland is, is kind of um, working with integrating the maps into the system that we have. So I can't speak too much to that, but I know that, you know, we, like I said, we have a bunch of this, of course, but like what, all, we, all we needed to do right now was showcase like how this basically could work. So, but thank you for bringing that up. It's, I, I will report back. <laughs> yeah, it's, well. Um, for now, we haven't seen a reason to move away from it. I'll answer that. We have another project called ATL Maps which is a really awesome project that's actually more done than this, but for some reason we haven't released it, and that's internal politics I don't understand. But please go to atlmaps.com because it's fully functional and it's great, um, that uses Leaflet. So we have this kind of institutional knowledge around it. So. Um, you've shown a bunch of stationary videos, and we've seen things from the, the drone. Are, you, are there any ideas to have like guided tours or flyby tours with, like, mm -hmm. you know, Timestamp locations, and, you know, voice yeah. So there, I think we've, we've been in conversations with Michael yeah. Page, who has all the ideas um, to do um, something. Well, I can't quite show you. Maybe, um, for example, or even the Sapelo piece, um, that you could have some type of video in a, in a piece where you can see video or see images, and the map will travel with you. 
Um, possibly the drone video would play in the left-hand pane and you would move across and you'd see the trajectory on the map and be able to follow with it, yes. Yeah, it seems like you, should, you would be able to uh, like even indicate where the drone is. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yep, and that is on the list. I'm also <laughs> thinking we, uh, our first trip there to Sapelo together as a group, uh, Michael had a GoPro that we put on to the front of the vehicle. And good thing I brought duct tape. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> whatever stand was used for it, it was not, no. Nah, wasn't wasn't <laughs> adapted for those kind of conditions. It's true. But a GoPro there, that's a really good example of where you can get the vehicle eyes view of going through mm -hmm. the island, and then it's connected it to the place in terms of yeah. the GPS. And part of it is that we were it. we were mapping some of these roads for. Right. I mean, the first time. In, in our minds, the first because they're not mapped right now. So. But I love the idea yeah. of having, say, a video on one side and then an old 1940s style, yeah, yeah <laughs> showing yeah. the progress. And I think you know, the, through the landscape, part <laughs> of it is doing research. Like, how are outlets who are way better than this than we are displaying this kind of content, this kind of immersive content? And we've seen a lot of really fun pieces out of something like the New York Times or something like that that's doing some of this really fun stuff. And we're like, why can't we do that? But you know, we do have to ask the question there. Like, we have. We have drone footage. Drone footage is pretty. Everybody loves drone footage. How can we make the most use of it? But we also have to be asking, what is it doing? Of course. Mm -hmm. So far, we've had an answer to every one of those questions, I think. So all of it's mm -hmm. going in. But you know, we do have to keep asking that. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about, since you mentioned the use of this in uh, your college classes, mm -hmm. but possibly also even elementary school classes could use the material, <coughs> very interesting material. Uh, have you thought about how to how to package it in a form that would be more easily usable by a teacher other than yourself? For example, I don't know in what grade in Georgia uh, people might study marshes or you know whatever, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, have you thought about it in terms of where it would fit into their curriculum in what week, mm -hmm. you know, on what topic, or You've got all kinds of materials here. Some of them are probably relevant to one kind of a question. Mm -hmm. Others are relevant to a very different question. Mm -hmm. And have you thought about uh, organizing it in terms of like a suggested curriculum? Yeah, and here is the, the partnership. The important of the partnerships, it comes up again here, is that um, we're hoping to, to leverage folks who are interested in, in partnering with us um, to help us create kind of these, these paths to content. Um, because I'm not a K through 12 instructor, and, and Tony is a fabulous mm -hmm. pedagogue, but um, you know I'm not sure exactly and how I much you know. <laughs> I'm like I yeah. don't know when they mm -hmm. learn about marshes in Georgia either. I'm not yeah. from there, so um, I think that one of the things in terms of implementing the the project, um, and that means you know fleshing out the content entirely, um, or well fleshing out the base of the content so that more content can be built upon that, um, is is the start of this. Um, discussion of what it means to make it a K through 12 available website and then uh, we do and with this project and another one we're working on one of these like large projects where we need to create a context for its use um, is that we want to have materials um, or at least pathways to materials to help teachers utilize the site and that's definitely one thing that we're aware of and it's part of the implementation phase of it so right now for the prototype you don't see it here because it's not but it it's definitely probably is. the potentially most frustrating thing mm -hmm is when you've got a website that's got lots of neat stuff, exactly. but people aren't aware of it or how exactly. to use it, so it might end up just kind of exactly. sitting there. And occasionally somebody finds it and says, oh, neat, I'll put this on my Facebook page or something. Yeah. But, but mostly... But how to use it? What, how do you make use of the content? Uh -huh. And we're running into this question. Um, there's a... And this is, again, and for those of you who work in digital scholarship, in the, especially in production, someone comes in with a great idea, and we have this ability to archive moon stuff from the Apollo 15 mission and I'm, we're all big Apollo nerds apparently in the center we just learned we're like oh this is great let's do all this stuff with the same but who is it for and we're like okay well it needs to have some pedagogical purpose someone says that in a meeting and we're like but what does that mean somebody has to go and create this create pathways to use for the users you can't just you know say oh here it is and expect people to somehow know where it is or know how to use it or know where it fits into a curriculum you have to we it's our it's on our to show people the possibility. follow up on that, yeah. uh, part of it is how you set up a pathway in your web page design. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be honest, I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and I saw, oh, beautiful, if I'm interested in Georgia coast, I'll be so happy, mm -hmm. and then I could explore it, I could, but then beyond mm -hmm. that, I didn't know where to go. I'm like, I, of course, I didn't spend very much time looking sure. at it, but wh yeah. where do I want to go, and if I go here or there, what am mm -hmm. I going to find out? I didn't know, like, what was the point? And the, I have the question, is there a point that you want to lead people toward, and is there a pathway toward their getting the point? Mm. Or is it just like all kinds of neat stuff, let mm -hmm. them figure it out for themselves? Mm. Yes. <laughs> is there a point? Like, to, is, is there an argument for the site? Or, or yeah. It's alive or, or, I mean, so, there's, so there's definitely a point, and here, um, as a monograph, if we want to use the term monograph, I, I, it's not closed. That's the other thing that I have a problem with using the term because it, it somehow insinuates in my mind, and it may be incorrect, that it's a closed document and it will not be a closed document. But using that term with that caveat, does it make an argument for something? And I think Tony would argue with yes. And that was kind of one of our first points was this um, conveying the sense of, of space and time and place together. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, want to say more about that kind of vision of the project, um, on top of that, a sense of exploration. And this is where I think connecting with the pedagogy, uh, we're going to have to connect with K through 12 teachers or people who specialize in that. How do we make the mm -hmm. site so that it is something that a teacher could go to at a K through 12 teacher and they will um, have incentives to explore it? And then how do we, the next step, how do they get their students to explore it? and discover for themselves rather mm -hmm. than leading by the nose all throughout, go click here, click here, click here, click here. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge for us, especially at Emory. We don't mm -hmm. have, uh, as of three or four years ago, they got rid of their Department of Educational Studies. So we don't have colleagues at Emory who can help us with that. Mm -hmm. So we will have to go outside of Emory for that. Mm -hmm. But that's something we have been thinking about in terms of what you mentioned with partners. Mm -hmm. Having, say, some of these environmental organizations that are on the Georgia coast that have connections with local educators, that'll be a first step, seeing what would engage your students, or you as an educator, mm -hmm. and your students to connect better with this site. Mm -hmm. And I think this comes back to kind of the traditional printed atlas, like a coffee table atlas or something like that, that you, I mean, I maybe have before, not sure why, read it linearly. Um, atlases are kind of you flip to a section you're interested in and you read the content ar related around to it you might flip here and there to kind of explore it but it's not a linear document um, and I would argue that a lot of the works that we work that we use in our courses aren't linear either I you know <laughs> having <laughs> I'm teaching my course right now in an introduction to Hinduism and I certainly don't use any book from front to back um, so the creation the helping and partnering, I guess, with educators w at whatever level um, to create pedagogical materials for the use of the site, I think is extremely important. But we definitely want want to stay away from implementing a linear model for the for the atlas to stay with kind of the traditional exploration part of it. To echo what Tony said, mm -hmm. so, yeah. But I mean, these are these are the hard questions of this project. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I failed to put any email addresses on this, but we're ecds at emory.edu, generally speaking. So if you have anything that comes up or questions, you're like, I found a typo on the site. Can you actually send that to me, Brian? Right there. Thank you. Yes. I will look at this later. Question, what? Other ones. Thank you. Amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. In our long form pieces. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But okay. if um, if you're interested in exploring parts of the site and have additional questions, please send them on or contact Liz, and she can help you contact us. Many thanks again. Yep, thank you.